It's Finding Faith. The hands that hold it all are good hands. It's good to be in God's hands. Hey, good to have you with us too on this Thursday edition of 2020. And very shortly, we will open our talkback lines. You might like to take the opportunity to ask questions, uh, make a comment. You might have your own insight into some of the things we're talking about today. We are in the deep end. Uh, The sorts of things we will talk about are controversial things. We're turning our attention to some Christian analysis of some of the disturbing developments within the religion of Islam around the world. And we'll initially make a focus just to our north, our near neighbours in Indonesia. Back in August 2021, a former Muslim scholar, now a Christian apologist, was arrested in West Java and charged with blasphemy over his YouTube channel. He was subsequently sentenced to 10 years in jail and that was reduced to six years on appeal. Then late last year, just November last year, a young Christian YouTuber named Rudy Simamora was arrested in North Sumatra and charged with, you guessed it, blasphemy. He was sentenced to just last month, uh, 23rd of February, to a year in jail. And thirdly, a Christian theologian, Gratia Pello, who taught at a Bible school in East Java, was also arrested in December last year, and he has not been seen since. We'll start talking through some issues around Indonesia. We'll extend our spread of some things that are disturbing that are developing around the world with Elizabeth Kendall, a religious liberty analyst and advocate for the persecuted church. Elizabeth is a former principal researcher for the World Evangelical Alliance Religious Liberty Commission. She's also an adjunct research fellow at the Arthur Jeffrey Centre for the Study of Islam at the Melbourne School of Theology. And you can get detailed insights into persecution of Christians around the world when you visit Elizabeth's website, elizabethkendall.com. Elizabeth, a special welcome back to 2020. And thanks for having me, Neil. Elizabeth, I said, let's get a focus first. Uh, These arrests in Indonesia... Uh, people who are apologists and accused of this word blasphemy. Uh, Give us your insights into a big picture of what we are seeing right now. Well, I sort of get the, I get the feeling that there's been a, um, there's been a rise in Christians who have become trained, trained as apologists to engage Muslims, to debate with Muslims, and uh, the, this has taken place over the course of, I'd say, a couple of decades since the 9-11 terror attacks. And we're now, this is now coming into like its maturity. And Christians are debating online. They have YouTube channels where they engage with Muslims. They run conferences where they debate and engage with Muslims. And the backlash is really beginning. Now, in Indonesia, we've got those three cases you mentioned. The, they're quite different in some respects. The first one of Muhammad Keese, he was an Islamic scholar, taught in an Islamic school, and when he became a Christian in 2014 and was baptised, he realised that uh, he had a lot of skills up his sleeve already and a lot of knowledge. And eventually, by about 2020, he had set up a YouTube channel and was debating with Muslims online and teaching about uh, what the Quran actually says, what what Islam actually teaches. And eventually, uh, Muslim scholars in Indonesia said, right, we're getting rid of this guy. And they charged him with blasphemy and arrested him. And the very night that he was jailed, he was beaten almost to death. And so he's both an apostate and an apologist. The second, the young fellow you mentioned, he received only 12 months in jail because he was pretty small scale, low key, and he confessed to his crime and repented. Uh, The third fellow, uh, Gratia Pello, this is an extremely concerning situation. So he's been essentially disappeared since he was arrested. Uh, and, And that, I find that, very concerning. There has not been a a date set for his trial um, and nobody knows where he is or what's happening to him. He's a theologian 
and an apologist. He's Coptic Orthodox. He has an enormous understanding of Islam and Arabic and Christianity, a Christian theologian. He ran a YouTube channel on apologetics and he's been arrested and disappeared. I'm, I'm very concerned about his well-being. As you say, you can date this back to uh, 9-11. Uh, so we're going back just over 20 years. And so 20 years of developing scholarship because up until 9-11, there would be a lot of Christian scholars who hadn't necessarily given their attention to uh, how you face the challenge of Islam, because Islam wasn't necessarily anything to be super concerned about. But all of a sudden, 9-11 came, and then uh, there's this development, uh, almost a, an outpouring of people who are interested in how you, as a Christian, answer Islam. And I mentioned uh, you've got your connections there at the Melbourne School of Theology, and that's been something that's been very significant over this past decade. This is something that Australians have taken an interest in, and I assume that all around the world people have become interested in understanding the Christian response to Islam. That's not always well received. What are your thoughts here in this rise of interest in Christians being able to answer Islam? Well, I'm actually, I really welcome it. Um... I would say that there is a before and after 9-11. So like if I go back into like my university days, like the pre-9-11 days, uh, people would go to university and they would come in contact with like navigators and campus crusade and evangelistic groups. And after 9-11, we see the rise of, um, th this is when like people like Dawkins and Hitchens speak out strongly against religion. You know, God is bad. Religion poisons everything. That becomes the narrative. And all of a sudden, there's, a, there's an awakening of the need for Christian apologetics. And we're also at the pointy end of the long march through the institutions. So the universities are secularizing. And then Dawkins and Hitchens come along with their great anti-religious diatribes in response to the 9-11 terror attacks. And uh, there is a revival, really, of Christian apologetics. It goes from being, uh, you know, three books on the corner of the Christian bookshop to like a whole department. It really starts. And, of course, the other thing that happens is that a lot of Christians, just as you said, go, oh, my goodness, I, I don't understand Islam. And I know Christian theologians uh, and pastors who have um, – got their PhDs now through the Arthur Jeffrey Centre at Melbourne School of Theology, that that's what started their interest. It was the 9-11 terror attacks and they realised, oh my goodness, I need to understand Islam. They, they went back to study and 10 years down the track, by 2012, we've got a, 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 like this generation of trained apologists coming of age who are debating Islam very, very effectively. And everyone has access to what they are teaching because in a day, a digital age, social media and YouTube, you can spend uh, your whole night just uh, going from clip to clip and you can find all sorts of things uh, where people are talking about Islam, are talking about Christian apologetics. Uh, this age of, this digital age of YouTube, this is actually, is this making the problem worse? Is it making Christian persecution worse? Um, I mean, this is an age, isn't it, of perhaps a deepening fundamentalism in Islam and, the, and uh, they won't be taking these sorts of things lightly. Well, that's right. And this is what people need to understand, that it all goes together. So we've got this situation now where because of the internet, because you can put your conferences up online, uh, you can actually go online and watch a conference on Christian apologetics and, and you can watch people like, like Jay Smith and Andy Bannister and other people or, or the Australian Mark Dury teaching on Islam, teaching about apologetics and you can learn a lot and people can pick it up all over the world. And every time governments try to clamp down on this stuff, people get smart, you know. So in Iran and Indonesia and Pakistan, Christians uh, use VPNs, even in Afghanistan. You know, there are Christians using 
uh, VPNs to protect their identity and their locality. It basically bounces their locality all over the world so they can't be picked up where they are. And they can tune in from, you know, northern Afghanistan <laughs> into a into uh, some apologetics on Islam. And that is amazing. And Muslims are coming to Christ because of it. And, of course, there's a backlash. So the two things go together. I, I And I'm constantly reminded of a beautiful little, like a... a um, a picture in Revelation, I think it's the last verses of Revelation chapter 10, where the angel eats this scroll that's really sweet and becomes bitter in, in his stomach. And he says, you will go and t tell all the kings and all the people about Christ. And I sort of think, yes, we have to remember that there will always be this sweetness and the bitterness will happen together. And yes, Muslims are coming to Christ and Christians are developing this wonderful apologetic, but the backlash is very painful for many. Elizabeth Kendall is our guest, a religious liberty analyst. You might have a question, a comment, even a critique for our conversation. I do want to open our talkback lines, 1-800-316-316, to be a part of our conversation today. It's not always easy to be a part of a conversation like this, but if you've got something to offer... The opportunity is there. 1-800-316-316. We're back with more in just a few moments. Our talkback line open. 1-800-316-316 to join in our conversation, a question, a comment, even a critique. Elizabeth Kendall is our guest, religious liberty analyst and advocate for the persecuted church. We are talking about issues around Islam. Elizabeth, out of the three of those identities we've been talking about, um, there might be some listeners who would be saying, what is it that these people are saying that is so controversial that they would be arrested, convicted and jailed, or even in one of those cases, never to be seen again? Uh, if we're taking, say, uh, Gratia Pello, for example, what would have gotten him into trouble? Well... <clears throat> His, his uh, YouTube had become very popular, so he's got like 51,000 followers, mostly in, in Indonesia, which was causing a great deal of concern for a lot of, uh, you know, Islamic scholars. They don't, they, don't, they don't like this sort of thing. And on one occasion in February of last year, a Muslim uh, who called in uh, was really blasphemous about the Lord Jesus Christ and referred to Jesus as, you know, this like illegitimate, you know, nothing. And uh, and he criticised the Bible and said, oh, the Bible, you know, has all these lies about the prophets in it. Because in Islam, the prophets are perfect, right? They just don't sin. But in the Bible, the Bible's very honest. And, and it shows that David committed adultery. Da you know, the, the sins of the people are exposed and we learn from them and we see their repentance. Anyway, Gratia Pello responded to this blasphemy by doing a, an episode in which he talked about the difference between uh, the, the Quran and the Bible and Muhammad and Jesus. And he noted that while Jesus was holy, uh, Muhammad actually lusted after and eventually took as his wife his own daughter-in-law right so he took his daughter-in-law from his adopted son uh, and married her and that the quran sort of legitimizes this and pello says but in the bible sexual impropriety it's honest it's there but it's always condemned as sin that needs to be repented of and then he then he expands the gospel on how people can repent of sin and have their sins forgiven and that episode uh, really, really riled the, the Muslims because they don't like, particularly they don't like Christians talking about, uh, you know, Muhammad's sexual improprieties. They're all, it's in the Quran, it's in the Hadiths, it's in all the Muslim biographies of Muhammad. But when Christians start talking about it, that's when they usually get, get you know, accused of blasphemy against Muhammad and a blasphemy even though what they're saying is just uh, basic well knowledge. But anyway, that's why he was arrested. Uh, he was arrested on the 6th of December 
just taken from his home and he hasn't been seen since. Yeah, very, very disturbing. So a simple comparison between religions and, uh, as you say, talking about those things that are way out there, they're front and centre, but because the Christian Bible would actually define some of those issues around the Prophet Muhammad as being sinful, that actually then becomes blasphemy. Uh, so uh, anyway, listeners might have uh, their own say and uh, interested in your thoughts around those things. Let's take a call. Our talkback line is open, 1-800-316-316. Uh, let's first of all hear from Sue in Kingston in Tasmania. Hi, Sue. Welcome. Hi, Neil. Thank you for taking my call. Look, it, it's a wonderful discussion you're having, but it really deeply concerns me because clearly there's only one creator. There's one God Jesus has given us the truth, and I've studied the Quran. I think because I came out of a very toxic Catholic family background with a lot of bad stuff in it, I was determined to find out what God's truth was, and it wasn't until I was 41 that I came to know Jesus. And uh, the truth of John 3:16. So I, it saddens me deeply when I hear of this evil that's going on with the warrings, with the abductions, the killings, everything that's happening because of religion. When God is a God of love and Jesus came to say, stop everyone, just honour the one creator, love one another, but put God first and be reconciled. So we're all Sue, I think you are reflecting uh, what we'd even understand from the very first commandment out of the Ten Commandments. Uh, but while that might be a commandment, doesn't mean that everyone's going to hold to that. And uh, when you've got more than one God or uh, more than one focus, as we're talking about, uh, then you're actually looking at conflict. Uh, Sue, let's get a thought or two from our guest. Elizabeth, what are your thoughts for Sue? Ah, yes. Well, this goes right back to that age-old question. Do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? Is Allah the same as the God in the Bible? Now, Muslims, and lots of people would say, yes, he's the creator. So well, there's one God and Muslims and Christians worship the same God, the creator. But if you look at the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran, Allah, they are polar opposites. They are completely different different characters altogether. And then if you look at Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, and you look at Muhammad, who is the messenger of God, you have polar opposites. Muhammad was a warlord. Uh, he was a warlord, and, and you can't get away from that. And so one many converts to Christianity from Islam will say, oh, Christianity is the religion of life, while Islam is the religion of death. And they see them. They see the polar opposites. With Christianity, the gospel is targeted at the heart and seeks to change the heart of the human being. And from there, the human being lives and behaves differently in the world. Islam is the polar opposite. It uh, brings Sharia law, Islamic law down over the top of everybody and enforces uh, everybody to live by Allah's law. And uh, it's, it's very, very different to Christianity. I, I would have to say that while both religions recognize a creator, the character of, the, of Allah from the Quran and the God of the Bible, they are polar opposites. They're Sue, not the same. Sue in Kingston, Tasmania, thank you very much for venturing those thoughts. We're just not too long out from news. Uh, stay with this just for a moment in the lead up to news for a quick comment, Elizabeth, because oftentimes you'll hear people talking about the monotheistic faiths and you talk about uh, Judaism and Christianity and Islam and they say uh, the common factor in there is they date their histories back to Abraham. But that's a fallacy, isn't it? As you're describing this now, even the history doesn't necessarily hold together, does it? Uh, no, it doesn't. And, and and this is one of the things that's only really, I think, become part of scholarship probably again since 9-11 when real critical scholarship in Islam really took off. 
there's a there's some really interesting studies that have been done even on things like geography the geography of the quran doesn't match up with the geography of the middle east um and many people believe that it's very likely that that the that the, the that a lot of the theology of islam developed uh later than the arab expansions the arab imperial uh wars that it was probably centered around uh maybe petra in jordan which is a a uh, an earthquake zone and that this was like part of a like an apocalyptic type of um a religion it's really really complex so there's a there's yeah there's a lot of controversy in that area at the moment. Uh, we might talk some more about that. Uh, listeners can participate one eight hundred three sixteen three sixteen. A question, a comment, even a critique for our conversation. Welcome one eight hundred three sixteen three sixteen. Elizabeth Kendall is our guest, religious liberty analyst. Her website elizabethkendall.com. And uh, she's been writing about these issues we've begun to discuss around Indonesia. There's plenty more to talk about, and we're continuing after Vision National News. Wonderful to have you with us on this Thursday edition of 2020, and we are into some deeper waters today. Even a controversial conversation around some developments in the religion of Islam and seeking some Christian analysis. How might we think as Christian believers on some of the disturbing developments within the religion of Islam. We've been talking about a crackdown on three Christian apologists in Indonesia. One jailed for 10 years, another for one, and a third who has been missing, not heard of, since his arrest. And there are more incidents that might indicate a deepening fundamentalism in Indonesia and, of course, in other nations around the world. We'll give some attention to that with our special guest, Elizabeth Kendall, the Religious Liberty Analyst and Advocate for the Persecuted Church. Elizabeth is a former Principal Researcher for the World Evangelical Alliance Religious Liberty Commission. She is the author of a number of books, one called Turn Back the Battle, Isaiah Speaks to Christians Today, another one, After Saturday Comes Sunday, Understanding the Christian Crisis in the Middle East. Our talkback line is open on 1-800-316-316. Elizabeth, want to talk about some other issues as well, but uh, perhaps we'll take uh, a caller who's been waiting patiently before we move into those areas, uh, let's take a call from Alison in Doughboy in Queensland. Hi, Alison. Thanks so much for waiting patiently. What are your thoughts? Uh, yes, well, I appreciate all that I've heard and um, I really admire and respect Elizabeth for her stand and highlighting this to us, of course, because this is something we are aware of, but to actually have it highlighted again. Um, but my concern is, uh, you might say it's more of a personal nature because like when you publicly put yourself on YouTube and a web page and uh, say a Facebook page like linked um, and you promote Christianity uh, and you are, um, you know, you promote Christianity in its true sense of the word and you are then open yourself for um, I guess targeting because I just say in the last month or so I have had many many followers which on a daily basis uh, which are not true genuine followers and so I just just would like your comments you mentioned something about VPS or VPN which I just a lay person really I never heard of anything like that. Mm. Alison, I think we're talking through some issues here. And yes, uh, when there are preachers of the gospel, oftentimes there is a contrast uh, to the message of the gospel into whatever culture that Christian finds themselves in. Perhaps that's the thing that creates all sorts of tensions and even violence and backlash. But Elizabeth Kendall, uh, your thoughts here for Alison? Uh, now, VPN, I haven't got it in front of me, but I think it stands for Virtual Private Network. And I think what happens if, is you actually you pay for it, like something you buy. It's like a, uh, like a firewall or an antivirus type of thing. So you buy that, and what it does is that your location cannot be detected. 
Uh, like I, I've got a, an Iranian friend who's very concerned. She's on the internet a lot and she's very concerned that she doesn't want to, you know, people to know where she is. And so, you know, so she has a VPN and, and it just bounces. I think it bounces your your uh, location like all over the world. It feeds it everywhere. So you can't be tracked and people can't track you down. But um, I only know about it. I've never, I don't use one, so I can't really... I uh, have much to say um, about that. Okay. Uh, Alison, thank you so much for your call. Um, did you have something further to add, Alison? Uh, no, just to thank you and God bless you. Okay. Alison, thank uh, you. 1 800 316 316 to join in our conversation. We'll take some more calls in just a few moments. Let's come back to Indonesia because if we're hearing these disturbing developments of Christians being arrested, imprisoned or even disappearing, uh, we might be concerned about whether there is a rise of some intolerant fundamentalism and whether that's coming from the government. Uh, uh, Let's get a thought or two from you here, Elizabeth. Uh, What are your other thoughts around things developing right now in Indonesia? Well, uh, fundamentalist Islam is growing in Indonesia, and this is because of decades of work, mostly by Saudi Arabia and the Saudi clerics, to uh, spread their intolerant uh, Wahhabi ideology. So Wahhabi Islam is Sunni Islam uh, in the vein of their um, of the uh, religious reformer Al Wahhab. And he was a, a full-on fundamentalist. And since the, since the 1980s, the Saudi, Saudi clerical establishment has been free with lots and lots and lots of money because of a deal they brokered with the Saudi royal family to just pump this ideology around the world. And so what we've seen over the decades since then <clears throat> is, you know, like in, in cities like Nairobi and Jakarta and other places – that we're all very secular, where Muslims and Christians live together, uh, we start to see veils. We start to see the mosques becoming radicalized. We start to see Muslims demanding things like no blasphemy, no apostasy. Uh, and uh, if we start to see the growth of radicalization. It doesn't, it hasn't happened overnight. It's been happening for the last, you know, three decades plus. But all of a sudden, you sort of reach the pointy end and and it falls upon you and you think, oh, my goodness. The situation in Indonesia became very clear at the last presidential election where uh, I think that was like 2019, I think, when President Joko Widodo uh, was forced to take uh, his vice president uh, was was a leading Islamic cleric from one of the largest Islamic bodies in the country. Now this is J- Jocko Wadodo sort of made his name out of from being, you know, like open and tolerant. When he was the governor of Jakarta, he had a Christian deputy governor named Ahok, a Chinese Christian, and uh, but he's been forced into this position now where he has had to. He actually had to, to get elected, have a an Islamic leader, a fundamentalist Islamic leader as his deputy. And there's every evidence now that the next election, which is only next year, so we're already like in election year mode, is going to be even more uh, filled with like Islamic popularism. Uh, to get votes, and it's very, very concerning. The the the, the trends in is in Indonesia are concerning. And the way these things look when you apply them to the real world's news headlines, uh, there's a controversy, as I understand it, now developing around uh, whether an Israeli soccer team under 20s uh, will be able to play in Indonesia. Uh, just very quickly on that, uh, that's a that's a story that's developing now, isn't it? It is developing just now. So basically, I think Indonesia won the rights to host the, un- and I might not be 100% right with how this is all falling together, but um, to host the under-20s FIFA World Cup soccer or to host some matches anyway. And, and those matches were going to be in Bali. And when when the Israeli team qualified, the uh, 
the head of uh, like Indonesian soccer or whatever in, in Bali said, oh, we can't possibly have an Israeli team here in Bali. There's no way we could guarantee their security. In other words, they would be expecting Islamic rioting uh, could, could be a problem. And then the Islamic organizations came forward and said, we can't have an Israeli team here because we don't have diplomatic relations with Israel. You know, we're pro-Palestinian. No Israeli team can come to Indonesia until there is an independent Palestinian state. And of course, this puts the whole hosting of the under under 20s FIFA Soccer World Cup in doubt. And so President Joko Widodo is running around trying to fix it and not lose the thing. But that sort of, that, that shows you how um, Islam is politicised and how how radicalised uh, things are becoming there. Let's take some more calls and let's be mindful. We'll try and be brief with the calls and brief with responses, but let's take a call. Mike is in Tasmania. Hi, Mike. Welcome. Hi there. Um, look, about VPN, if you Google Nord VPN, N-O-R-D VPN, you'll get some information about a VPN. Okay. Thank uh, you very we'll much. We'll take that as a comment there for anyone who wants to remain a little bit more anonymous and uh, so people can't track you down easily if you're saying controversial things on the internet. Let's take another call, an anonymous caller calling in from Queensland. Hello. Welcome along. Hi, Neil. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, I've just got a question. Um, I hope it's relevant to the conversation. Um, my children attend a Christian school, and um, at the start of this year, there's um, been a Muslim family who's come to the school, and um, one of my children's in upper primary, and um, there's a, a son um, in his grade. Um, my question is um, how... I know we're obviously to love people and I've encouraged all my children to do that. I suppose what resources or what things can you recommend in terms of helping my son in particular decide at this really, um, I suppose, pivotal age um, about what the right thing to do is in this circumstance? Because, I mean, he doesn't understand um, a lot of the differences between Islam and Christianity because of his age and because we don't study the Quran. I just wondered um, if you could point me in the direction just to equip myself and our family in terms of navigating these challenges. That is a really wonderful question because a lot of Christian schools will enrol families that come from different religious backgrounds and uh, the Christian school will see that as an opportunity to have an embrace of different families from different religious backgrounds. But the presence of that different religious family uh, creates all sorts of issues around the people who are a part of that Christian school and what they're learning in a Christian context. Your thoughts here, Elizabeth, for our caller. Yes, that's really interesting because... um uh, my daughter went to a Christian school that had a number of Muslim families there, and you know the Muslim the Muslim families are just like quite a lot of um, uh, even like atheistic families that are out there that sort of want they want their children to have good values, and they're looking at the state system, and they're thinking, okay, well the, at least the Christians believe in you know like. Uh, sexual fidelity and they 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 worship God and they have you know a lot of sort of attitudes that we share and they just will not send their children to the state school into the state school system and it's a wonderful opportunity for us to uh, show love and to have an influence in these families lives I attended I think I, I hope you find this really encouraging but I attended a an Islamic uh, apologetics conference it was pre-covid at the Melbourne School of Theology with some of our top apologists, um, Richard Schumach uh, and Andy, Andy Bannister came out from, from the UK, Mark Dury was speaking. It was pretty heavy, it was a pretty heavy full day. We got a big, you know, spiral bound thing of all this stuff and we talked and there were so many questions and it was just, and someone asked right at the end, he said, look, uh, how do I remember all this stuff? There's just so much. He said, you know, there's so much to read. There's so much to remember. And Richard Schumach said, look, you can take all this apologetics. It's fine, but stick it in your back pocket, he said. He said 99% of Muslims who come to faith in Jesus Christ do so because a Christian has loved them. 
they have befriended them and loved them. And, and they find that just completely radical. And I think, I think if we are just loving, we are friends, we are kind, we are followers of Jesus, we don't hide who we are, uh, but, and we love them because we're followers of Jesus. We are generous because we're followers of Jesus. Husbands love their wives because they're followers of Jesus. Parents love their children and don't frustrate them and exasperate them, as the Bible says, because we are followers of Jesus. We love our neighbours because we are followers of Jesus. And we open ourselves up to conversations that are usually can be very straightforward. I think it's really can be really helpful, you know, just to go to your local Christian bookshop and and find just a, a really simple book. It doesn't need to be, you know, a thousand pages of apologetics, just a, a simple book that will give you some understanding from a Christian perspective of, of what Islam says and how it differs from Christianity. But really the most important thing is that you can witness for Jesus you can show Jesus and that you are a loving friend because you are a follower of Jesus and uh, you know we believe in sacrificial friendship because we are followers of Jesus there's no there's no Passover in the Quran there's no crucifixion in the Quran these qualities are our qualities and I really loved that comment of Richard Schumach you know that 90% of Muslims who become Christians do so because a Christian has just loved them. And I think that's really, really encouraging. I'm always encouraged too when you hear of Christian schools who are not afraid to enrol the Muslim family because the Christian schools don't feel as though there is anything to, to fear on that basis of apologetics. Uh, our arguments hold together beautifully. Uh, so our caller, our anonymous caller, was that helpful so far as, um, you know, maybe get a hold of a small book from a Christian bookstore and uh, then if you want to go further, you can, but a small book, but um, don't don't neglect love. Any did, Was there anything uh, further from you? That, that's basically the way I've approached it, even meeting the family and everything like that. I just, here listening to the rest of the conversation earlier, I just wanted to get a bit of clarification. But thank you for that, Elizabeth and Neil. Uh, wonderful to thank hear you. from you. And Elizabeth, time is even fairly short right now and a number of things just to still just cover off on. Right now, we're in a time when the Muslim world is having a time where they're deepening their spirituality. It's what they call Ramadan. It started about a week ago, goes till uh, later in April. Uh, it can happen at various times of the year. This year, in fact, it'll cross over our Easter. And sometimes there are some tensions that come out of Ramadan in the Muslim world. Uh, what are your thoughts for the fact that Ramadan is on right now and that there may be even some cause for concern? Yes, well, Ramadan is actually a pre-Islamic practice. It was practiced all through the Middle East before Islam was there. Uh, it was the time of um, of peace. So it was, and it was so understood that this was the time of no fighting, a time of peace, that caravans would be able to travel around doing their trade unarmed. Uh, Muhammad uh, had a revelation, he said, from God that this was a good time to attack the caravans in order to feed the Muslims, right, to support the Muslims. So Ramadan actually became a time of uh, war for Muslims. Uh, the whole idea that it's a time of peace is just a furphy. It's just not true. It's a time of, of conflict and of advancing Islam. But that's not to say that for many, many, many Muslims, they do view it as a time of peace and family, almost like we, the way a Christian society views Christmas, you know. But um, it can be a time in many parts of the world of incredible religious uh, tensions because of this. And, and about 30 years ago, uh, there was a group that put together and decided that they would pray for Muslims during Ramadan. So it started in 1992. Uh, a group called World Christian News agreed to manage this uh, Muslim prayer focus through Ramadan. It's been running for 30 years now, and we are seeing Muslims come to faith in unprecedented numbers. And we cannot, as Christians, I refuse to 
believe that there isn't a link between this global movement that has just exploded of the 30 days of prayer for Muslims during Ramadan and and the and the conversions to Christianity. Now you can you can buy just for a couple of dollars there a um, a digital copy of the 30 day Muslim prayer focus just by going to the website. If you just Google 30 days of prayer, you'll find it. Um, it's 30 as in three zero days prayer dot com. And you can just for a couple of dollars uh, buy the digital uh, booklet. Otherwise, most Christian bookshops will have a hard copy, which is a lovely thing to have, uh, beautifully illustrated, and you can keep it uh, in your hands and use it during your prayer time. So that's been an amazing thing, the 30 days of prayer. And uh, yeah, and we need to be praying for Christians too, especially in some very tense places like Pakistan uh and, and 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 other places like indonesia where there's a lot of tension between uh muslims and christians a lot of growing islamization because this islam ramadan can be a very tense time what about our easter in the middle of all of this because easter has in some sense uh, come under attack uh, this time of year. It's not necessarily a safe time for Christians in nations around the world where there are higher levels of persecution. But let's not talk so much about that, but about what Easter might mean to the Christian believer. Perhaps uh, the focus on the cross and as we see a growing evil trend perhaps around the world, how do we see Easter and the message of the cross, how that relates to us today, Elizabeth? This is one of my favorite topics when it comes to praying for the persecuted church. So way back in the 16th century, Martin Luther wrote this incredible dissertation on the theology of the cross. And what he realized was that, that the cross is not just an event, you know, from Good Friday through to Resurrection Sunday. It's more than that. And he said the cross is even more than what it, it achieved, you know, our salvation, our redemption our forgiveness. He said the cross is revelation. So it reveals to us something about the way in which God works in the world. He said, and basically what his, his whole idea is, when we look at the cross, we can see that God works by inserting himself into the problem and, and essentially blowing it up from inside. So he doesn't sit up in the clouds, you know, throwing lightning bolts like Thor or whatever, you know, like the Greek gods or something. He inserts himself into our dilemma. God comes as a human being. He comes as a, as a man, as the Lord Jesus Christ. And he actually surrenders himself to our problem of sin. And he is killed unjustly. He is murdered. He is tortured and executed. On, on a cross, one of the most horrible symbols of torture. And in, then darkness comes over the land. And, and can you imagine the terror of it? But in the midst of it all, God is doing something amazing. It, he has entered our problem and he is literally blowing it up from inside. He is redeeming the cross itself. So that symbol of torture, we now wear it around our necks. We put it above our churches because it, it's not just a symbol of torture. It's the symbol of our salvation, of what God has done. And when you look at all the terrible things that, is ha that are happening in the world today, we can take hold of this and say we have a God. We can know that we have a God who inserts himself into our problems and, uh, and subverts it. And so with, with Islamic terrorism is, a, is exposing the evils of Islam and has a great part to play in bringing Muslims to Christ. God is at work. And as we learn from the cross and from that first Easter, Sunday comes and Sunday is coming. Well, what a wonderful insight that is. Uh, I'm busily writing down notes as you're sharing those things. Uh, just wonderful, wonderful insight uh, from, first of all, we might say Martin Luther and uh, reflected beautifully by you, Elizabeth Kendall. 
We have run out of time for our conversation. And uh, just for listeners, you might like to access the podcast of a conversation like this and send it on to your friends and family because uh, conversations like this just don't come along every day, as I'm sure you will appreciate. It's right up to date, things that are happening right now but things that are so important and such wonderful insight that help us to navigate our lives and the way things are unfolding in our own nation and appreciating how those things contextualise for us as Christians as those things develop around the world. Uh, Let me point you to elizabethkendall.com. That's Kendall with one L on the end, K-E-N-D-A-L, elizabethkendall.com. You can sign up for Elizabeth's Religious Liberty Prayer Bulletin And there's an opportunity to connect there too and uh, even, perhaps even, uh, donate a few dollars uh, to the good work that Elizabeth Kendall is doing in this field. Uh, You'll know that she has a almost unique capacity to be able to speak into these types of topics so beautifully. So don't neglect that opportunity to make a donation when you go on to her website. Yes, subscribe to that Religious Liberty Prayer Bulletin. Keep up to date with developments as they're happening and so far as the persecuted church around the world. Uh, for those uh, listeners who might be a little younger, potentially, you can follow Elizabeth on Instagram too. She's got an Instagram site and uh, those sorts of issues that she likes to keep informed about because there are generations that are growing up now that need to have access to the sorts of things that Elizabeth is so very able to communicate beautifully. Elizabeth Kendall, thank you so much for taking some time to share your thoughts and your heart with us today on 2020. And thanks again, Neil, for having me. 